Um, and so they're available later on for you to, to look at and to share with others. So the webinar today is going to principally look at lighting in historic buildings. From one of our um, events, we had a lot of people that said, oh, could we have something on lighting, something to do with, you know, what types of lights you should use in historic buildings? If you find historic light fittings, um, what should you do? Can you reuse them? So our free speakers today, which I have around 10 to 15 minutes, and then we're going to take questions at the end of that. Now, while they're talking, please do put any questions you have in the chat. Um, if you've got a specific question for one of the speakers, just add their name to it to say, you know, Simon or Chris or Geraldine, you know, I've got this question for you. Or if it's just a general point, just leave that blank. So um, without much ado, I'm going to move on to our first speaker. And our first speaker is Geraldine O'Farrell, who I work with at Historic England. Geraldine is a Chartered Building Services Engineer and has been with Historic England and its predecessor, English Heritage, for the past 25 years, um, working in technical conservation teams. She has both written and presented webinars on Historic England's published guidance on internal and external lighting design, um, plus energy efficiency and daylight harvesting, which is what she's going to cover today. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then Geraldine, if I could ask you... Um, to share yours, please. Can anybody see that? I can see that, yep. Yeah, yep. yep. okay, lovely. Thank you. Right, well, thank you, Caroline, for the introduction. Um, today, I'm going to give you a rather whistle-stop rapid tour of Historic England's investigations into daylight harvesting and its prospective use in heritage buildings. The results of this work have become part of a suite of lighting guidance produced by Historic England's Building Services team, of which I'm a member, along with the organisation's own investigations and commitment into energy and carbon reduction. So it was decided around 2021 that we should investigate whether, in theory, heritage buildings could employ daylight harvesting. And we wanted to ascertain whether it could be difficult, given the balancing act between using as much daylight as possible and keeping glare and heat gains to an acceptable level, coupled, obviously, with the various room layout considerations that come with older buildings. So what is daylight harvesting? Well, to be brief, it is a sustainable control technique that automatically dims and adjusts the brightness of light from the luminaires in response to the amount of natural light available in the space. Therefore, we can reduce our reliance on electric lighting and in turn lower our energy consumption and reduce the building's carbon footprint. In addition, it can also potentially improve the health of the occupants, which we'll come to in a minute. However, as with most things, it's not quite as simple as it would appear. And there are other factors that have to be considered. We asked Hawley, consultants Hawley, to carry out two studies on our behalf. They in turn created a 3D model of each of the offices chosen. The two historic offices used as our exemplars were first um, a similar at first and the simpler study was on our offices in Newcastle upon Tyne, which is shown on the right. This is a grade one listed 16th and 17th century merchant's house called Betty Bessie Surtees House. Now, the second much larger study was on our grade two offices in Swindon, known as the engine house shown on the left. This is Victorian and a much larger building with very different structure and layout to Bessie Surtees. A great deal of information gained from our own Matterpoint camera scans, in addition to plans, existing lighting installation, desk layouts, current office usage, and the listing records from the National Archive in Swindon were all made available to allow Hawley to create models that were as accurate as possible. So here's a quick overview of what I'll be covering today. Now, there's not enough time to go into any details of the metrics used in the case studies, but I'll go through the results achieved and the key outcomes. There is a more detailed information on this on the Historic England website, including the recording of the Technical Tuesday webinar on the whole study, if you're interested. 
So what are the potential benefits of sunlight? The impact of daylighting on our health and sense of well-being is now well understood and SIBSI have produced TM40 2020 to show how these plus other performance parameters such as acoustic, thermal and humidity impact our health. As diurnal animals, in other words, we're awake during the day, or most of us are, sunlight supports our biological requirements by triggering our circadian rhythms or body clock via non-visual receptors in the eye. By increasing daylight within our working environments, we can potentially create happier, healthier and more, more productive spaces, as well as saving energy by not using artificial light for as many hours. There are even luminaires on the market that attempt to replicate sunlight by using specifically tuned LED light fittings. But that approach still uses energy and is not for every situation, especially where access to a window is possible. Now, having established that in an ideal world, we would all be healthier, happier and more productive under daylight, we must then factor in the adverse issues associated with daylight, depending upon the building's orientation and the time of day or year. At certain times, we may find that daylight causes the occupants more problems than advantages. They may experience glare or thermal discomfort through solar gain. Now, this usually makes most of us reach for the blinds, shut out the offending sunlight, resolve the immediate issue, and that is where the blinds stay for the rest of the day. Even though the uncomfortable phase, especially regarding glare, may have passed as the sun moves around the building, people forget, so the free supply of light is obviously needlessly shut out. So before we look at the results of, from the study, how does such a system work? Well, on screen is a diagrammatic representation of how such a control system can be set up. There are other ways, but this is the one I've chosen to use. The required light level is set and the daylight sensors in each of the luminaires adjust their light output accordingly to achieve the required illuminance at the working plane, be it the desk or the floor, for example, depending on the work or activity being carried out. This slide gives an idea of the amount of the floor plate that such a system can control. This in turn depend upon the size of the windows and the depth of the room in question. It's been noted in similar studies that human beings are more likely to accept such a control system if they have a method or system of being able to temporarily override these controls, giving occupants some autonomy if they need extra light or there's a change of the type of task being undertaken for a short period of time. Such autonomy should be provided with care because, as with a lot of things, it may inadvertently circumnavigate the original goal. So the rooms chosen at our Newcastle offices were in two distinct parts of the building. The first was in the 16th century Tudor half on the right, and the second in the later 17th century Jacobean building on the left. The room and window proportions are different, with the Tudor room having a higher ceiling and deeper footplate to the office chosen in the Jacobean part. In addition, the room designs of the two rooms were substantially different, as can be seen. The rooms under investigations are those circled in red. In the bottom right hand corner, you can see a diagram indicating the proximity of adjacent and neighbouring buildings which impacted on the amount of light reaching the Newcastle office. The rooms chosen at our Swindon office, however, are shown on the right and very different. They are outlined in red as before on the on the right hand side and the large slash windows and roof lights at the engine house coupled with a very shallow footplate means that the daylight can penetrate deeper into the offices. Also, the diagram to the right of the screen shows that there is less overshadowing from the nearby buildings in this case. So here for comparison are two internal views of typical offices in each each of the studies. As you can see, they present very differently. So which, I wonder, are you guessing, are the two historic buildings performed the best? So here's the basic study approach and the prime objectives. There are other factors involved that we do not have time to go into, 
But this is the basic reasoning behind this theoretical examination of how much the lighting requirements, such as lighting level, can be achieved in the space without the need for artificial lighting. Here are the results for the two rooms of Bessie Sertie's house. The image on the left refers to the Jacobean period, the right hand side to the early Tudor. The values assumed for material reflectance are given in the list on the far right hand side. Now daylight autonomy relates to how successfully each of the two rooms could be lit to a predetermined level of 300 lux using daylight alone. With the orange and red colours indicating success in achieving that light level and the bluer shades indicating failure. By the way, the term SDA that you can hopefully see in along the top of the uh, image indicates, it, oh, sorry, it means spatial daylight autonomy and is used to assess how successfully each room met that predetermined light level. Now you can see by the diagrams that the rooms are very different in shape and size. And it is worth noting that this study was designed to take place during the winter months when the sun is lower in the sky and therefore its light penetrates further into the space. However, this is normally when more artificial lighting is used and SAD or seasonal affective disorder sufferers are most likely to benefit from natural light in their workplaces. The results indicate that the Jacobean half of the house performs better than the Tudor with an SDA of 62.5%. The Tudor half only achieves 37.9 and although it is southeast facing and has plenty of glazing, its position on the second floor means it is overshadowed by the building opposite as we saw in slide nine. Now Hawley's analysis indicates that the annual lighting consumption for the Jacobean room with its larger windows and shallow floor plate could reduce this from about 620 kilowatt hours to 320. This is based on using the fluorescent lighting which was installed at the time of the study. This type of lighting employs an energy consumption of nine watts per meter squared, just as a reference LED is in the region of three watts per meter squared. So even with the SDA for the Tudor room being less than it was less, it was established that a sizable energy savings could still be made, along with that of obviously CO2. Here are the results from the larger and more detailed study at the engine house in Swindon, with yet another term to explain, I'm afraid. Here we have a slightly more nuanced indicator of how beneficial daylight could be. On the screen are the results of the analysis for the level two offices with and without blinds. The first new term that can be seen on the top of the screen is called UDIA or useful daylight illuminance and the clue is in the word useful. Useful daylight excludes excess levels of daylight likely to cause overheating or glare or where there is insufficient daylight when artificial lighting will be required. The range for UDIA chosen for the study was between 300 to 3000 lux. Now the second new term UDIE is a measure of the illuminance levels in excess of 3000 lux where glare might become a problem. The diagram on the left indicates that there may be a small issue with glare for those sitting next to the windows if the blinds are not lowered. This is shown by the small areas of yellow along the external, external walls in figure 10. Other than that, there's not an area in this sample that experiences excess illuminance with or without blinds. As it is evident, this is a more useful measure than that employed in the initial simpler study involving the Newcastle offices. So the office uh, on level two in Swindon appears to be a good candidate for daylight harvesting. However, with large windows and a shallow footplate, we need to employ other metrics such as temporal analysis to be certain. This metric identifies the time and the areas where blinds are occasionally needed to avoid glare. In our more detailed study, it was found that the offices on level three that also have roof lights in addition to the large sash windows did not do so well. 
and results indicated that the space would experience more glare and longer periods where UDIE predominating, meaning more use of blinds. So the conclusions that came out of this study were to consider installing automatic blind control, make changes to the internal furniture layout, move people away from the perimeter and retain and possibly amend the design of the blinds to the roof lights, amongst other things. However, in both buildings, it was established that there are potential and substantial savings that could be made in the long run, long-term long energy use by installing daylight harvesting controls in the offices. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, I'll hand over back to Caroline. Thank you, Geraldine. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, if anyone's got any questions for Geraldine, if they could put those in the chat, that would be great. Um, so on to our next speaker, and our next speaker is Chris Dix, who is an Associate Director at CBG Consultants. Uh, Chris is a chartered engineer with 20 years experience uh, in the industry. He leads a team of ME and P engineers and lighting designers with a specialism in historic buildings. And he's led on some fantastic buildings in some really significant historic buildings, such as Blenheim Palace, St Paul's Cathedral, Woburn Abbey. Um, he is also an active council member of the Sibsey Society of Light and Lighting, and he re he's a representative for their home county's northwest region and regularly organises some of the events and seminars on lighting there. So, Chris, um, over to you, please. Uh, thank you. Hopefully everyone can see the slides. Yeah, we can see the Great. slides. Okay. Yeah. Um, so a very brief outline of what I'm going to cover. Um, uh, I've been asked uh, to talk to you a little bit about uh, the practicalities of actually reusing uh, existing lighting in the context of a historic building. So uh, I'm going to um, talk a little, about, little bit about when lighting might be considered part of the actual history of a building. Uh, considerations in reusing it. Uh, a quick case study on Ely Cathedral, uh, the gasoliers we've been working on there. Uh, and then a, a little look at um, TM66 and the uh, circular economy. So uh, with the question really is the wider construction industry now uh, coming to value retrofit? Uh, and, and the Q&A actually of course will be at the end of uh, the three talks. Uh, so uh, Caroline's kindly uh, spared you the uh, introduction, so I won't say uh, any more about myself or uh, CBG consultants. Uh, and uh, straight on to uh, looking at when we might consider historic lighting uh, to be sort of part of the um, important aspects of a heritage building. So I think the first thing to say here is that age and heritage value don't necessarily correlate. Uh, often it's the integrity of lighting to an original scheme that's particularly valued. Uh, you can, of course, uh, consult things like listed building information and uh, talk to the foundation architect to um, uh, understand the uh, context of uh, any important lighting in the building. Uh, and there might be other reasons uh, why particular lighting is uh, important. So this um, photo, you can hopefully make out the engraving here, a church in Chatham. Uh, it was actually the first building to be lit in Chatham by electricity. Uh, and, and some of those lights survive today. Uh, so you, you can see um, the examples of those here. Of course, what appears old could also be a recent addition, uh, lacking any sort of heritage value, uh, or, or it may even be detrimental to uh, the building heritage, um, the so-called sort of Disney factor. So uh, one has to be aware of that. But the client and the architect aren't necessarily going to value that heritage lighting for its own sake. So all buildings first and foremost need to deliver suitable lighting for their purpose. Um, clients and donors may also want to see a wow factor in um, spending a lot of the money on the building only to see the same old light fittings back there um, could end up disappointing. And, and of course, old lighting doesn't equal good lighting. Um, the example below uh, before and after photos from uh, St. Norris, uh, sorry, St. Ives uh, Norris Museum. Uh, on the left was some uh, vintage sort of pendants from the probably the 1930s with little glass shades, um, quite nice in themselves, but really, really poor for actually lighting a museum space. So the decision there was taken to put in uh, entirely new modern uh, LED lighting. Uh, but actually we retain just a couple of the glass pendants uh, in, in the right hand photo 
in a, in a mock-up of the original founders study so so incorporating small amounts uh, but generally having to move on from what was there before uh, so a quick case study here this is uh, taken in Ely Cathedral um, and uh, right and left here uh, highlighted are um, two uh, uh, gasoliers which were originally actually lit by uh, gas uh, lighting and, and are being um, refurbished as part of a larger uh, relighting project that the cathedral were uh, involved in. Uh, so the original gas lighting uh, we think was installed in the mid 19th century and carried on like that until the 1930s uh, and it's about all that actually remains of that original scheme um, those two uh, gasoliers standing at each side of the high altar. Uh, it was first converted to electric lighting in the 1930s uh, and um, it's had several alterations since. So these photos at the bottom here were actually taken uh, during a previous renovation in the 1990s uh, and, and provided to us by the archivist. Uh, so you can see the original gas uh, pipes on the left hand side um, coming up through the base. Uh, it also gives you a sense of the scale on the right, the two guys um, uh, unloading it carefully from a crane. <coughs> So they're now in the process of being, or in fact, they've been completed now, uh, being upgraded from tungsten capsule lights to miniature LEDs. Uh, as noted, those uh, historic records have been really, really useful to understand how they were uh, taken apart and transported and refurbished in the past. Uh, and once stripped down and cleaned, uh, at that point, a detailed design could be developed for the new light sources. Uh, and, and what we did there was to, to really look at the principles of previous adaptations. Uh, so these small uh, glass, you can see in the bottom right hand photo there, these small glass uh, crystals were fitted to the original gas spigots, which you can uh, see in the middle photo. Uh, and, and it's actually those that are being lit by uh, lighting concealed within the um, frame of the fitting below. Uh, on the right, in the middle photo, you can see one of the old capsule lights and, and to the left, the new um, small LEDs being installed. Um, magnetic fixings are being reused re, uh, to avoid any drilling or uh, intrusive uh, work on the fitting. And of course, with a view to the fact that it's almost certainly going to be uh, refurbished again, this isn't going to be the uh, last uh, operation. So they're now back in the uh, cathedral in their rightful place. Uh, and uh, you can see at the, the bottom photo here uh, that the lit effect of those LEDs just, just gently illuminating those. Uh, crystals there on the glass on the old gas spigots. So a quick look at um, this in the context of TM66 and the circular economy, which I'm sure um, a lot of people will have heard about. So uh, SIPSI have produced two guides in the past couple of years, uh, TM65, which looks at embodied carbon in building services and TM66 uh, lighting in the circular economy. So how we design fittings and uh, to, to be repairable and refurbished. Uh, and, and it places value on the embodied carbon of uh, lighting installations. So a talk I organized back in the spring at Coco Lighting up in um, Essex, where they specialize in um, stripping down and refurbishing uh, lighting that they estimated even a, a typical uh, fluorescent office light uh, weighing around eight kilos, they could probably salvage about six and a half kilos of the original material. So if, if one were to scale that up for hundreds of light fittings in an office, that's clearly a huge amount of embodied carbon you're saving. Uh, but what does this mean for heritage lighting? And uh, some of you might think, well, with the example of the gasoliers, haven't we just been um, doing this all along? But before we get too carried away with refurbishing fittings, it's quite useful to, to take a pause and um, sort of think about uh, why we might want to do that and how we might do it. So I've put together this little uh, checklist here. There's actually 10 uh, items with the slide to follow. Um, but I think first we have to ask ourselves what's wrong with retaining the status quo? Um, what's the objective of rewiring uh, or renewing the fitting? Uh, is it electrically unsafe? Is it too bright, too dim, too hard to maintain? Uh, is it going to be technically achievable and at a uh, economic cost? Uh, what are the risks associated with doing it? Should it be taken off site for a, a careful refurbishment or um, 
with the associated risks of transportation or could it be worked on in situ? Uh, and, and is it the intention to replicate the current lighting effect uh, or, or to do something different? Uh, but the photos below and interestingly, heritage lighting can be all sorts of things and um, there's an increasing value placed now on um, original neon signage, uh, with cold cathode uh, glass um, tubes and really much of the heritage value of that is in the actual glass and the technology itself. So moving on to that, if, if one is going to refurbish it, will you actually retain sufficient original character? Uh, you, you can uh, always improve energy efficiency, but, but at what cost? One wouldn't um, propose double glazing stained windows in a uh, cathedral. Have a think about whether the new technology might introduce new risks. So uh, we've seen examples before of uh, new drivers uh, fitted under pews in cathedrals to run um, uh, choir stall lights and those drivers have actually overheated and caused scorching onto the pew so uh, it, it doesn't bear thinking about what would happen um, if that uh, caused a fire. Uh, if an intrusive modification has disrupted the original design so if somebody's already drilled some new holes or done something can, can we reuse those to minimise uh, sort of piling on further um, uh, intrusive modifications? Are there any heritage consents needed? Uh, and, and finally, if the fitting isn't to be reused, what's going to happen to it? Um, not many clients are going to want a relic non-functional light fitting on display. Um, so if we're going to dispose of it, um, it, it could be uh, could be lost forever. But just a photo at the bottom here is so the project uh, we had at Guildford Cathedral, which was it's unusual in that it was uh, built in the 1950s, but is a, a listed building. Um, you can see on both photos some small uh, cornice uh, or sort of um, uh, scallop lights shining up the uh, columns and, and those are actually all original that have been uh, oversprayed with asbestos. So um, of course that uh, needed a lot of uh, decontamination and careful handling. And then a few practical considerations. So uh, if we're going to uh, refurbish a light fitting with a new source, well, what are we actually trying to replicate? Uh, colour temperature might be different, orientation uh, might be different. Um, you can see uh, below some uh, original Art Deco uh, light fittings at a project we were involved in at Brent Town Hall uh, about 10 years ago. Um, the, the, the particular lamps in them give a particular effect, which is pretty kind of patchy uh, on the glass diffuser. Uh, does one decide to go for a completely uniform wash or, or, or do you consider that those sort of imperfections are, are, are part of the charm? Um, I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong answer for that, but it's something you need to think about and consider and maybe even do some um, mock-ups. A few more thoughts. Many electric light fittings were originally adapted from gas, as we've seen, and I've got another example at the bottom here of a project we did at Oxford um, Museum of Natural History Museum, where uh, some old gas uh, uh, fittings were, um, some of them had LED uh, fitted to them, uh, and others were simply left in situ. Um, <clears throat> often the arms of chandeliers were inverted in the past when uh, light fittings would change from uh, gas to electric because of the technology differences, uh, no burning uh, upward flame to accommodate. So I think that, that the point is that um, a, de a degree of adaptation of the fitting can be justifiable in um, that historic context uh, to get the best result from the technology and um, some good uh, guidance here, a plug for uh, uh, historic England, um, some of the uh, those on the um, panel today may well have written, but, but there's quite a lot about this uh, on their website. And some final thoughts. Uh, so as um, Geraldine's alluded to or, or covered really, I mean, for hundreds of years, our oldest buildings had only daylight and, and there may have been very, very uh, limited specific task lighting. Um, remember medieval uh, congregations were probably illiterate and um, were, were simply listening. They weren't actually reading anything. Even in those uh, gas and electric schemes in the uh, mid 19th to mid 20th century, the technology was expensive, cumbersome and, and, and was used very sparingly. So we do have to ask, should we light it at all? Um, I think there can be a temptation with modern technology and tiny little fittings and clever wiring to 
light every feature and angle. Um, but of course, if we're going to save energy, we can't replace uh, old halogen lights only to treble the amount of new lighting going in the building. Uh, and finally, I think there's a beauty in darkness. So there's some lovely photo, uh, pair of photos below is it's not something um, we've been involved in, but a um, consultancy called Dark Source Lighting, who, who have a speciality in uh, dark skies and light pollution. Uh, and uh, as I said, this is what uh, removing a ton of uh, electrical carbon uh, dioxide looks like. Uh, and what they haven't done is to replace that blanket uh, poor flood lighting on the left with the same LED. They've, they've completely rethought it. Um, and, and I think they've gone for a very uh, subtle and beautiful scheme, which, which really um, makes the most of darkness. Uh, that's it from me. Um, uh, just to say, um, I've, Bruce Kirk, my colleague and myself, have written an article uh, all about this, which will be appearing in the next edition of uh, SLL Lightlines. So um, do take a read. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Really interesting. It's, I like that last example where, you know, you don't have to light everything and every, you know, because it's also not just the energy used for it, but it's all those materials in the light fittings as well. So, yeah, excellent point made Absolutely, there. Yes. Um, so I have Simon, who is our last speaker, and I'm just going to get Simon's slides up before I introduce Simon, just so then I'm not doing two things at the same time and I'll get one wrong. OK. Can you all see those slides? Yep. Great stuff. OK. OK, so Simon. Simon is the co-owner, Simon Wallace-Smith, who is the co-owner of Fritz Fire Lighting um, with his wife, Karen. And he's been working on everything from bespoke commissions, uh, product design through to commercial and residential lighting schemes. Um, for 40 years now, Fritz Fire Lighting has been restoring and refurbishing vintage and period lighting, which you can see in the background of uh, where Simon is at the moment, which looks fantastic workshop there. Um, so if I can ask you to start your presentation, Chris, and just uh, Simon, and just ask me when you want me to move the slides on. Will do. Thank you very much, Caroline. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening in today. So as per my bio, uh, in a nutshell, um, I'm in the business of uh, taking old light fittings to pieces, cleaning them, putting them back together again and converting them. Um, this occupies approximately a third of our workshop capacity and we're mostly working with uh, architects and interior designers to do this. Um, can we have um, page one, please? We're taking everything from a simple table lamp through to sort of complex and valuable items of historic importance. Uh, they are either collected or delivered to our workshops here in ross on -Wye. And in some cases, we work on them in situ. We prefer to work on items in our own workshop uh, where we have access to the various tools and equipment we use. So I thought it probably best to share a few images uh, of some projects we've worked on. Uh, and give you a little bit of background to each. Uh, next page, please. Here we see uh, a large and important 24 branch crystal chandelier uh, at the Pitville Pump Rooms in Cheltenham. At some point, it had been converted to electricity. Um, this this item, the work, the process was in, involved was that we. Whilst it was in situ, our engineers disassembled it in pieces and packed them away and relocated all those parts back to our workshop. Once it was in our workshop, we, uh, we removed all the electrical wiring, we took all the crystal components off and cleaned it all individually. We matched and replaced any missing crystal components. Uh, the whole chandelier was cleaned. Individually, uh, individually the arms were all rewired using um, I believe it was E14. Uh, the chandelier was then delivered back in a partially assembled state where it was installed. Once it had been connected and tested, we then redressed all of the crystal parts on it. It probably took us, um, I should imagine, maybe five days in our workshop here in Ross and Wye and a full day on site at the Pitville Pump Rooms. For reinstallation, a scaffold tower uh, was required, um, but before that tower could be installed, a structural engineer had to assess the strength of the floor and, and it needed to be covered too. 
There were a further six less significant uh, chandeliers that all received similar treatment. Next page, please. In this image, uh, we are looking at some very large period plafonniers at the Grand in Birmingham. Um, as part of a £52 million refurbishment project, we were commissioned by the electrical contractors to refurbish these uh, and other fittings uh, within this amazing historic property in the centre of Birmingham. This project involved the installation of emergency kit, daily conversion, extensive cleaning, rewiring and replacement from B22 to E27, provision of uh, additional electrical feeds for surface mounted directional spotlights, provision of high output dimmable LED lamps uh, at the correct colour temperature, and, and we had to ensure there was compatibility across all of the control gear. Uh, we also had to replace some of the glass panels that you see, matching the colour, texture and form. In some instances, there was uh, some structural repairs to be done too. The smaller fittings were all removed to our workshops for refurbishment, whereas these large ones were all worked on entirely in situ. Uh, they were so large, actually, that uh, Rowan, our smallest engineer, was able to get completely inside to clean, which was quite handy. Next page, please. This image shows the facade of High Store School in Sheffield. These important Art Deco lanterns were in a desperate condition. Solder joints were coming apart, loose and missing glazed panels, panels and old failing electrical components. These lanterns feature on the exterior and the interior of this amazing building and all needed to be refurbished. For us, this project involved uh, the removal by the main contractor and delivered to our workshops here in Ross. We chemically dipped these, uh, these, pit, these fittings uh, to remove all of the old paint. The surfaces were all keyed and wire brushed back. Internal structural repairs were required. All the open joints and glazing tanks needed to be reinstated. Each lantern was then bronze patinated and clear lacquered. The glazed panels and matched replacements were then siliconed into place. They were, of course, fully rewired and provided with E27 lamp holders and supplied back with flying feeds. Uh, Reinstallation uh, was carried out by the main contractor there. The next page, please. In this image, uh, we are seeing the guys in the workshop uh, working on a pair of lanterns uh, for the Shires Hall in Gloucester. This large pair of copper lanterns represent an important feature on the facade of the Shires Hall. This project involved again the main contractor removing them and delivering them to us. Uh, we, we removed old dust or dawn equipment. Uh, we had to remove the uh, corro heavily corroded internal steel structure, uh, which we remade. Uh, we powder coated that in an exterior grade powder. Um, it was then reassembled. There were various copper parts that had to be remade um, and they were reinstated. Uh, bevel glass panels uh, were cleaned and put back in and I believe we had to replace one of those too. Um, they were provided again with E27 lamp holders. Next page, please. Here we see James and Rowan uh, with the finished, uh, the finished lanterns, hopefully good for another 50 years or so service. Um, they're quite imposing pieces, very nice quality. The installation was completed by the electrical contractor. Can I have page seven, please? <clears throat> we also work uh, with various muse museum curators, curators to advise and source period uh, correct fittings. Uh, in the most recent of our projects, we worked uh, with the Holst Victorian House in Cheltenham and our work included working with the museum's team and electrical contractors to consider the decorative lighting scheme and what would be authentic. We then subsequently sourced each of these pieces. 
These were mainly a combination of original Victorian gas and oil fittings. Each of these fittings was then fully restored in line with the curator's requirements. So we had to restore them to a specific point so they looked authentic. We converted uh, the oil and the gas fittings. Uh, we also provided period correct shades uh, for them so they, they completely looked authentic. And we discreetly concealed wiring where possible in copper conduit uh, to give the illusion of a gas feed. Page eight, please. Here you can see just a couple of images, few images here of the finished project. Uh, we have worked on a number of similar projects, notably uh, the Canal Street at the Ironbridge Gorge Museum was a, a sizable project for us. Um, it's a nice, it's a nice sort of work we do. Page nine, please. Here we can see a before and after image of a uh, is a stock item actually. Um, it's a lovely gasolier. Um, it was carved uh, English alabaster. Uh, it had ornate cabochons on, um, decorative uh, brass detail, and hanging crystals. It was uh, originally um, a gas fitting. Uh, we 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 had to have uh, replacement alabaster parts made, and uh, the the mason was able to confirm that it was indeed English alabaster, of which there's no commercial mining available in the UK anymore. Um, and whilst restoring this piece, we discovered a uh, registered design kite mark on it, which enabled us to date it fairly accurately to 1860. Can I have the next page, please? This is our last project I'm going to discuss. In this image, uh, we can see a very large wooden lantern of Indonesian origin. Uh, it belongs to the uh, Cliff Castle in Keeley. Uh, this lantern was in danger of falling to pieces. Um, it, it was somewhat dangerous. It hadn't been cleaned in many years and all of the electrical components were well past their useful service. For this project, uh, we fabricated a steel skeleton frame uh, onto which we secured the original uh, glazed wooden panels. Um, of course, that meant providing fixings on the inside of the lantern to hold them in place. Obviously, all of the lantern was entirely cleaned and all of the woodwork was treated um, sympathetically. We also installed uh, new electrical components. This lantern forms an important feature for the castle um, and it sits in their main gallery. The reinstallation uh, involved a very high scaffold tower and a series of winches um, and a lot of grunting. Page 11, please. In this image also at Cliff Castle, uh, we can see an original Victorian um, lantern with its smoke bell, um, glazed panels and a lovely door. Um, again, we had to replace one of these panels. Uh, the lantern was uh, restored and uh, and then we assisted with the reinstallation of this and all the other items we worked uh, we worked on for for Cliff Castle. Page twelve, please. So we are sometimes asked to refurbish fittings that are clearly not old or have no historic value or significance. Typically, uh, fittings that are of recent manufacture are often difficult to disassemble and rework. The cost to do so can be disproportionate to the value once the work is complete. We can usually advise based on photographs, but it's often better for us to inspect the fittings. In some instances, fittings are too badly damaged and an assessment is needed to establish historic value and relevance offset against cost of restoration or replacement. The typical skills that we have in our workshop and our extended supply chain include metalworking, hot working, such as welding, brazing, soldering, 
polishing and refinishing, rewiring. And then in our outstanding extended network of people that we work with closely with, we work with casting, uh, lost wax castings, lead crystal working, glass blowing, flat glass working, ceramic repairs, wood repairs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are a few jobs that we can't undertake. Uh, each one has its own challenge. Next page, please. In most instances, we are replacing old lamps, lamp holders and candles, wicks and gas and oil burnings with discrete electrical alternatives. Generally, we are using E27 fittings. Uh, there are an excellent selection of branded lamps which provide a good cut, the correct colour temperature, lumen output and CRI output. In some instances, we will consider an integrated LED solution but we're usually working with the electrical contractors to establish what they require. The other considerations when we're looking at a project is dimming and darling, serviceability, access, can it be replaced and serviced down the line? Do we need to incorporate any emergency lighting or dust or dawn sensors? And do we need to incorporate any additional illumination? such as surface mounted spotlights on top of the um, plafonniers that we saw at uh, the Birmingham Grand. And another consideration always is lamp compatibility. So if we're installing equipment that is running off a dimming system, uh, we need to be sure that the, the lamps we're providing are going to be compatible. Colour temperature is obviously um, an important consideration. Uh, typically, we are working around 2,200 Kelvins through to 3,000 Kelvins. Most applicant, most applications, 2,700 is about right. Incandescent and gas lighting typically is less than 3,000 Kelvins. So we're normally fairly accurately able to uh, get that right. Can I have my final page, please? Uh, go on. OK, it is ultimately uh, it's the ultimate in sustainability to restore, repair and reuse rather than replace. Breathing new life into these old fittings and giving them another generation of service can only be a good thing. All removed electrical parts here are processed via a wee compliant disposal process. And well, that's it, guys. And I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for listening in. I hope you found it interesting and I welcome any questions. And thank you, everybody, for inviting me to do this. That's great. Thank you so much, Simon. Fascinating. Just lovely projects you've worked on there. Um, we have got some questions here. Actually, I've got a question for you, Simon, because some of the work and possibly Chris as well. Do you have or do you, I don't know if at the moment or in the future, do you see that there's a challenge in trying to get uh, to retain those staff or get new staff to be, that would have those skills to be able to do that, the refurbishment of those fittings? Um. Yes, in our extended supply chain, we're nearly always working with artisan makers, which mm -hmm. are the, the and typically these people are all approaching or already retired and almost operating as a hobby. And there doesn't seem to be much backup or training for them to hand over those skills. In our own workshop, they're principally uh, the, we, we sort of like to just have to consider what's involved and make sure we employ the right people to do those jobs. And we're fortunate to have that supply chain. But yes, I think down the line, we may have problems with that. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Chris? Did you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I could probably talk all afternoon about engineering <laughs> and the yeah, skills shortage we face. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's huge. And Oxford, you know, is an area where you, you do struggle to uh, recruit, you know, but, but actually I think... Um, by, by delivering kind of really interesting projects like this, you, you do draw some people away from those uh, consultancies that might just sort of stamp out fairly uh, uniform office buildings and, and, you know, give them a chance to get involved in something very uh, different. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. So there's one for Chris here. Um, has there ever been a situation you, where you've been asked to retain old fittings that you could not use in the new lighting installation, and if so, what was the solution? I've been thinking about this one, Geraldine, and um, it, it feels like it's more often me trying to persuade the client to keep something <laughs> um, that they don't want. I, I mean, those um, glass art deco uh, fittings in the um, old town hall, I'll show you, for example, 
Um, it, it does happen occasionally. I mean, it, it's often stuff that's of poor heritage value, but the client thinks, well, I, I put up those lights, you know, 15 years ago, you know, why should I pay for new ones? Um, mm -hmm. We had that recently on a grade one listed chapel that had been used as a library in the 1980s by the local council. And it had this, you know, metal trunking just hanging right the way through the middle of the chapel with um, awful kind of T8 uh, baton lights on it. And I mean, at one point that they accepted they were going to have to take it down to put up a tower to work on the roof, uh, but wanted us to look at putting it back. And um, that, that's sometimes the battle we have to uh, face. But I, I'd say, you know, where it does happen, like the Norris Museum I showed was it was a good example where, you know, we couldn't keep all those fittings, but we were just able to use a, a couple almost as a sort of museum of the museum, if you like. Um, uh, and finally, if you're working with big institutional clients like sort of cathedrals, Oxford colleges, uh, they almost always welcome a few things passed back to them for the kind of spares department to um, use elsewhere. Actually, something you mentioned, Chris, in your presentation was about, and I, I don't know why I hadn't really thought about it before, was to do the asbestos being on the lights. You know, we have our sort of asbestos surveys in historic buildings and you're used to it. And it, it just led me to think, are there other sort of hazardous materials that when you're refurbishing, I mean, Simon as well, when you're refurbishing these fittings that you tend to find, or is asbestos the main one? So, yeah, Simon probably knows better than I do. Um, <laughs> Not specifically, you no. know, it's, they're just usually very, very dusty. Um, yeah. uh, if we were in any doubt, we'd have to get some expert uh, opinion before we'd touch it. But generally... I'm not sure that I really come across that. You've Would you expect like the lead paint to think about? Oh, of course, okay. if you start yeah. grinding off metal, um, mm. yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's a usual sort of site risk assessment. To, yeah. To, yeah. So would you expect the clients so on a project, for instance, if, you know, was doing a building, it was like, oh, you know, we've got these, we think that they're, they're significant to the building, although very rarely they're in the listing. Um, we want to reuse them. Would you expect the client to have come up with that or would you be able to advise them? come up with what specifically come up with sort of if it was if they'd had an asbestos survey or anything else would you expect the client to go away and do that piece of work or would it be something that you could advise on i mean every client should have an asbestos register yeah. obviously so that the starting point uh, and then of course you do a um r d uh survey before starting any work and that that would um hopefully identify although often with sort of electrical equipment you know there's a blanket kind of uh well, you know, fuse boards may contain uh, asbestos uh, rope uh, and, and so on. So um, mm -hmm. I think it's like all these things you have to assume it is until you kind of know otherwise. But in practice, you know, you get an yeah. eye for what might be. And when, when, um, we, when we're going on site, we, we, we have to have done our asbestos training. So yeah. um, I've not done it myself because I don't generally go on site, but I understand it sort of alerts you to uh, what might be there and what you need to do in the event of finding something that, looks a bit dodgy yeah it's really interesting actually when I, what coco lighting um and this is something in the article that's coming up for light lines they they were restoring these beautiful uh or say beautiful but you know very um distinctive sort of perspex diffuser fittings only put up in an office building i think in the 80s or 90s that had t5 lamps in them uh, and one of the reasons the client wanted to keep the existing fittings and relamp them was because if they change the fixings at all the entire ceiling was a sort of asbestos no-go area so <laughs> by by keeping the lighting we solve another problem uh yeah of, uh, not sort of disturbing uh, asbestos yeah um question here uh simon do you have a preferred led chandelier lamp type supplier you use I do. Um, we tend to work, if, if it's E27, retrofit fittings, we're working with Wellit. Um, their sustain, sustainability credentials are great and they have a great, they're a smaller British company um, and we just like their ethics. We've worked with them for probably seven or eight years now. Okay. Very reliable products. Um, yeah, very happy with them. Wellit, they're called. Wellit. OK, and this is a question to both of you. Um, many old fittings use linseed oil, lead based putty for caulking. It cracks over time. Are there any acceptable materials in your repertoire? 
So we are using to re. Generally, we re, if we, we have to reset. Uh, actually, I don't know the answer to this question because the guys re, have to off, periodically reset glass panels within lantern frames. They're usually held in place with tangs, like little copper fold-over bits, um, which aren't always very suitable. And we will use a silicon replacement. Um, but I also know that chand crystal chandelier, chandelier arms are typically set into a receiver cup um, with like a plaster of Paris. And we use some chemical alternative for that that is uh, a stronger solution. Right. Um, I mean, Geraldine had another question here. So have you ever had an existing fitting that you couldn't repair? Is that I'm true? sure you have. Either, both of you, it'd be great to have both your answers. Um, no, not really. I think m more's the point that you have to identify that it just won't be economic to do that work uh, yeah. up front and you know there has to be a call made is it is it is it worth doing um more more actually is the case uh, that we receive uh, we're asked to price for jobs for classically flemish style chandeliers um which are sort of 30 years old or so and they're really poorly made they're probably not even brass they're probably brass plated steel or something and they're not easy to take apart uh you know and that the client wants us to do them because they're authentic to the building but they're not really you know they're, they're reproductions of poor quality we've got yes. almost that exact scenario at an oxford college at the moment where we're um, relighting some historic rooms and the, to, to be blunt the existing chandeliers are junk i mean you mm. tap them with a pen and um it practically dents them mm. yeah so it's just the quality, the original quality of the fittings are made of and the way they're made. The newer ones just don't tend to be the same as the old ones where you're able to sort of repair them and reuse mm. them. It's almost like there was a cut off around the 1950s where we were suddenly able to mass manufacture things really mm. quickly in big quantities. And anything before that is essentially like a Meccano set. You can, with a few simple hand tools, you can take them to pieces. And, the you know, some of the British fittings we're working on, they have like a... Uh, a Roman numeral and the parts only fit together in their rightful place and in terms of a piece of engineering they're really really nice things to work on and as we get much past 1950 that sort of drops off to be honest which is what we need to go back to if we're going to reuse these things is actually start to make things well and start to make things that we can repair and this exactly. is where tm66 yeah. comes in you know and anybody uh you know looking at lighting now and the circular economy you know it's some of it is to do with how you take a fitting in the field now and repair it but a lot of it's actually to do with manufacturers designing things now uh to make them repairable and mm -hmm. um you know we're going to see with uh, measurements for embodied carbon kind of coming into things like briam assessments uh overall kind of net zero assessments for buildings um you know, in the next few years, I think we'll see a real interest suddenly from clients in saying, right, I need to get this score in my embodied carbon assessment. Therefore, I need a, a, a light fitting that's got this sort of level of TM66 um, uh, credentials, if you like. And, and, and so suddenly it will incentivize manufacturers to kind of um, change tack. And we're seeing the wider legislation, like the right to repair and then um, all sorts of stuff so hopefully things will improve i mean although it's a little bit off subject on our contemporary collections we've endeavored to incorporate some of those design principles in everything we're making that's new it it is possible to replace every component within it with Fantastic. minimal work and and i'm a big advocate of retrofit as well because i think it's it, it, there are a vast array of good quality lamps on the market and i think i'd rather put my my effort into engineering something that i feel is serviceable and will last a long time and it will accommodate a good quality phillips or bell or whoever lamp yeah or fantastic well brilliant um we've oh we've actually gone past two o'clock so i'm gonna have to draw this to a close i just first of all i'd like to thank both three three of our speakers um great presentations and thank you for your time in doing those so 
just to wrap up today, um, we don't actually have another webinar planned this year, um, but a lot of the committee will be at Sibsi Bill to perform. You might have heard us talking about at the beginning of the session. Um, and this takes place at London Excel on the 5th and 6th of December. Um, you'll find a lot of us on the Historic England stand, which is stand number 102 just by the entrance. So it'd be lovely if some of you can come along and have a chat to us um, over the two days. But once again, thank you to our free free speakers really really interesting and it will be recorded this session so it'll be available afterwards um, if you want to share it or listen again that's great thank you very much and have a really good day thank you thanks everyone Th thank you very much thank you bye-bye bye now